Hello, this is Ozzy Oswald, and welcome to Religion and Life. For as long as people have been religious, they've been embarking on journeys of self-discovery, visiting sacred places, and completing sacred rituals. Why do religious people sometimes endure the hardships and expenses associated with religious pilgrimage, and what role do these journeys play in developing spirituality? To help us understand the role and function of religious pilgrimage is Dr. Cheryl Claussen, who has studied religious pilgrims and their journeys. Welcome, Dr. Claussen. Hello. And not only have you studied them, but you have been on numerous uh, pilgrimages as well. Right, all of them in Mexico. All of them in Mexico. So <laughs> uh, before we start talking about pilgrimages, um, let's talk about you. Uh, you're one of the first um, faculty members that I made contact with when I arrived on this campus 31 years ago. So we have a kind of long history here, but. Uh, uh, tell us about your time at ASU, um, what you taught, uh, what you wrote about, and, and what you're still writing about. Well, I'm an archaeologist, so I was in the anthropology department here. And um, I started out in, uh, as a hard scientist doing chemistry and shell biology and um, pretty quickly exhausted anything that I thought was interesting to say about that. Mm -hmm. And um, I had... Uh, I've always been torn between ethnography and, and archaeology, and when Appalachian State had uh, initiated an exchange program with a university in Central Mexico, University of the Americas in Puebla, in Cholula, Mexico, I uh, applied to go and went, and that was in uh, 1990, hmm. and I fell in love with Mexico. Um, so since 1990, so almost 30 years now, I've been going back at least twice a year, and for the last 15 years, I've probably been going about four times a year. Mm. Um, and that reflects my increasingly more humanistic and less scientific uh, focus in anthropology, so that somewhere around the mid-90s, um, I pretty much stopped writing about shells and started writing about people and <laughs> rituals. Right. And I've um, done some uh, books on uh, rituals and beliefs in archaic Eastern North America between 9,000 and 4,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and as, in an effort to educate myself about what the potential for landscape features has in ritual practices, it occurred to me that in Mexico I could participate hmm. in pilgrimages that were um, emphasizing landscape features, sinkholes, springs, waterfalls, mountaintops, right. caves, and that that would really teach me a lot about what one could expect of the landscape in the past in ritual activity. So, so when, when you talk about landscape in this way, is this a way of talking about sacred geography or these yeah. feature, landscape <clears throat> features that have some type of, of sacred bearing on the people who are observant of them? Right, and this idea that the, that the divine can manifest at any place, at any moment, which makes every rock, every tree, every mm -hmm. dragonfly, every... Um, uh, flower, bird, bear, raccoon, skunk, potentially <laughs> um, there to say something to you right. or to interact with you or to reveal something to you. So is um, the idea that a landscape feature can have sacred bearing, um, is that one of the features or one of the characteristics or maybe one of the requirements uh, for a pilgrimage or, or a sacred place? Is this, is this what's drawing uh, pilgrims uh, to the place that they're going? Pilgrimages are always thing oriented. There's always at least a thing that's mm -hmm. the destination and probably 90% of the time that thing is housed within a place and so the so the place is actually the destination. Um, for instance fertility, you would think that fertility would be something that wouldn't have a place-based um, uh, attachment, but in fact it does. There are certain places in the landscape where people historically go to solicit 
continuation of their own family and their own group. Mm -hmm. And again, back to springs and caves and waterfalls and mountaintops and sacred trees and um, you know that, that one petitions for fertility at a particular kind of place. Right. It's not just at home um, looking yeah. at your medicine cabinet. Uh, there, are, there are places where one would, would find it more efficacious um, to get forgiveness or to get rejuvenated or mm. to get mm -hmm. um, fertile or, you know. Yeah, so when you say place, it doesn't necessarily have to be a humanly constructed place like a cathedral, uh, but it could be. Um, but I, I think of, when you say place, I think of something like Mecca um, or um, the Holy Land for Christians and Jews, um, or you mentioned earlier uh, Guadalupe, for, uh -huh. which is the largest uh, pilgrimage site, you said? Uh, it's the, the largest world. pilgrimage in Christendom. In Christendom, yeah. Uh -huh. oh. So the place itself um, has some significance beyond it being a mountain or a stream, and there, there's some kind of history there of interaction with human culture. There's a history yeah. of revelation. Right. So this place continues to be uh, a place where one successfully petitions for whatever it is one wants. Right. And after two or three or four years, uh, if it's an annual pilgrimage and nothing happens, hmm. then people will abandon that place. They'll they'll tell you that the deity abandoned that place so that finally they finally figured out there's no point in going there yeah. and someone will have a vision in some other place and the news goes out and so pilgrims flock to that place yeah. because the divine has revealed itself through that um, through that rock or right. through that you know weird phenomenon and I you know they think of spirits as moving around the landscape and you can offend a spirit you can you can entice a spirit um, and you entice and hold us you capture a spirit you ensure the continuation of the successful petitioning in a place by honoring primarily through remembering that spirit mm -hmm. So one of the, I guess, the primary function I'm, I'm hearing you say is that of a pilgrimage is to be able to petition and receive a blessing of sorts or something right. uh, from a spiritual entity. Right. And the way a place gets uh, connected to that spirit or that power is through this history of connection with the people. And it's somehow result-oriented, right? If, if, if people don't believe they're getting what they're going there for, then mm -hmm. that pilgrimage site will fail to... Oh, well, and it works both ways, it. too. If the spirit or the deity feels offended or unremembered, they'll leave that place. Okay. So, so one of the... Pro so we've got sacred places, we've got revelation, uh, we've got this interaction between the deity and, and the people. Uh, but I guess the one thing that uh, kind of stands out in my mind that makes it a pilgrimage is a journey, right? I right. mean, it's uh, um, oftentimes an arduous, difficult, and even <clears throat> expensive journey. Yes, So all of uh, those things, particularly for these communities in Mexico. Right. So what is it about that process? Is, does that the process of journey have any bearing yes. here on what's going the on? The journey itself is, um, they will tell you the journey itself is cleansing. Mm. So if you bleed... If you blister, if you sweat, if you cry, if you hurt, that's um, you are uh, cleansing yourself. You're working out the sins. And the more you bleed and the more you blister and the more you cry, <laughs> um, it's obvious to all your fellow pilgrims um, that you really needed <laughs> to go on this pilgrimage. So it's a purification yeah. process before presenting right. yourself. I mean, you to should be tired. You should be... Uh, you should be weak, your resistances are down, you should be receptive hmm. um, by the time you get to the shrine, which is your destination. Psychologically receptive? Um, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, so the, the part of the process um, uh, breaks the body down, if, if, if you will, uh, maybe breaks down um, um, the emotions and the psychology of the whole thing, and that makes one spiritually receptive to whatever... It's a so the pilgrimage is a social level or two. Hmm. I mean, you can have a rich person and a and a campesino, a farmer, on the same pilgrimage, and the rich person is bleeding twice as badly as the farmer mm. is, yeah. and you know everybody's assessing that rich person had had some 
sins to get rid of. More or, sins, I guess. Right? Yeah, or, right. or or had just hadn't been on, you know, a lot of people do pilgrimages every year. Right. And then some people only do pilgrimages once or twice in their life. And so they've built up a large backlog of mm -hmm. needing to cleanse themselves. And do pilgrims bring offerings? Yes. Uh, and perform rituals? Is this yes. part, okay. Along the way. Yeah. Uh, and depending on the length of the pilgrimage, um, <clears throat> there are, uh, th that's what inns were about, you know, people having places to spend the night along mm -hmm, a pilgrimage mm -hmm. route. Right. Um, and uh, here in Mexico, some of them you can do without having to spend the night to get there. You spend the night once you're there mm -hmm. because the um, night time is when these rituals take place. Um, but uh, some of them you, like if you're going from far southern Mexico all the way up to Mexico City for the Virgin of Guadalupe, December 12th pilgrimage, uh, it may take you 40 days hmm. to walk. Uh, so there's lots of nighttime. And, and one anthropologist has said, and I think he's right, that, um, that cities grow up around shrines because particularly uh, hard to get to shrines because once people get there, <laughs> they stay and they may stay forever huh. or they might stay a week or they might stay a month, but then vendors uh, collect around that shrine to uh, mm. supply the people who are tarrying um, at that place. I think the reason Mexico City is the largest city in the world is because of the Virgin of Guadalupe pilgrimage. That's really uh, insightful and it makes sense because you have to have the infrastructure and that builds on itself. And people may spend, particularly people who have come from 40 to 50 to 60 days away walking, they may have spent every penny they have to get right. there. They can't go back until they get work or until they meet up with a relative that'll give them the money to go back or whatever. Okay, we have uh, two or three images I want to look at uh, to kind of illustrate um, just a little bit of what we've been talking about. And then I want you to talk about your own experiences. But here, um, obviously, uh, we, we have a picture of uh, pilgrims on well, the way. One thing I notice in this, it's quite common for men in particular, but some women too, to have a special pilgrimage bag. Okay. Um, um. And, uh, and if, if it's on a peyote pilgrimage, they'll be, their peyote will be in there, and then the, uh, whatever things they need, um, both to uh, focus themselves as well as to make themselves comfortable, okay. will be in those bags. And then their destination is probably the top of that. At least, at least the leader of this pilgrimage destination is probably going to be the top of that um, uh, mountain that you see there. Mountain tops are typically sacred places and, and special yeah. meeting places between the divine and human beings. Right. Um, so I think the next uh, image is. Um, it looks like to me that it's a shrine in route, perhaps. It uh, could along. well be, mm -hmm. um, particularly if on sh on pilgrimages that you have to spend the night. Um, there's usually an altar set up at that location. If there's any kind of geographically um, unique or unusual feature, like a, a huge balanced rock, or a rock that has a human profile, mm -hmm. or a rock that looks like a turtle, a big, I mean, I'm talking big geological things, or a waterfall or whatever, there'll be uh, way station shrines set up at those places and people will pause and pray and leave an offering at the way stations and then continue. Okay. And then the, the third image, um, I'm not sure what this is. Uh, I think it's supposed to be a destination shrine, uh -huh. uh, but we were looking at it earlier and you said it could be um, uh, a shrine in a house or it could even uh -huh. be associated with the Day of the Dead. But when you arrive at the pilgrimage site, you might find the shrine that would be something like this. Um, right, and the front group, um, it, the first group to get there are going to be the ones who are preparing the altar. Mm -hmm. So by the time the last pilgrim arrives, um, the altar will be all decorated and ready. Mm -hmm. and, the, and in fact, depending on how late the last pilgrims are, um, the rituals may be well underway. Mm. Um, and this, this must be a shrine to a thirsty god because I saw there's several, several bottles of soda pop at the, uh, at the bottom of the shrine. So. Uh, this this <laughs> Uh, uh, shouts a Latin American 
yeah. shrine because yeah. Coca-Cola is uh, is a very typical thing to put on there. It, it costs money. Right. Uh, it costs more money than some of the locally um, available liquids. Um, so that's a that's a that's a sacrifice. Okay. Well, let's um, let's hear about your particular. Uh, experiences on your pilgrims and we've got a beautiful painting here that you were kind enough to to bring in um, and I think we can uh, take a look at that and you might want to uh, talk about what's in this yeah painting. Um, um, this is a painting by a man named Marcial Camilla Ayala and um, I met Marcial he is a Nahua um, he, he speaks Na Nahuatl is his primary language and Nahua was the language that the Aztecs spoke. As they conquered areas in central Mexico and southern Mexico, they um, enforced Nahua as the language. So this group um, is one of 28 Nahua speaking villages along the Rio Balsas River mm -hmm. in Guerrero, Mexico. And um, they all have rain calling ceremonies that happen May 1st and 2nd. And this particular rain calling ceremony that happens overnight on March, on May 1st, um, is very large. And if you could count, you would see that there are 28 crosses hmm. with lays of um, marigold petals, uh, marigold blossoms strung around each cross. And each cross then represents one of the 28 Nawa villages along the Rio Balsas. So pilgrims from each village come on May 1st. Many of them will actually show up uh, late April. And they camp out, they come by donkey, they come by van, they come on horseback. And um, uh, that, uh, the advance group will be the ones that are dressing these crosses. And the, uh, the crosses will have on skirts, they'll have uh, blouses, they'll have um, candles at the base of each cross, They'll have chocolates and coffee and mezcal, which is uh, alcohol, um, at the base of each cross. And then the, the group that's keeping up the cross uh, keeps that up 24 hours a day. There so is always a candle burning. So this is a Christian site, or is it a okay? Is it, is it an Aztec? <laughs> I was thinking Aztec, uh, ancient Aztec. The date is Aztec. Okay. The right. purpose is Aztec. The people doing it are Aztec descendants. Right. It has a very thick Christian overlay. Uh, they're going to use a common book of prayer. The, the Anglican common book of prayer. So it's not a Catholic Christian. Well, it's well, it's it's a Catholic book of prayer. Okay. Let okay. me All right. let okay. me back okay. up okay. there. All right. They're going to invoke thunder mm -hmm. by shooting bottle rockets into that sinkhole. And that thunder is what's driving the birds out of the sinkhole there. Right. Those go on nonstop for three days. Um, and they, they are getting more and more powerful in Mexico. The, the bottle rockets will knock your socks <laughs> off. Um, and then um, most of the... Uh, all of these pilgrimages that are going on in Mexico today are sponsored. Mm -hmm. And so every year at the pilgrimage, the next year's sponsoring couple, it's always a married couple. Um, you never have a single individual do this. This is very much a female, male, married, honorable couple of the community is asked to sponsor the next year's pilgrimage. Mm -hmm. There is one village that owns this pilgrimage. And so the sponsorship always comes from some, some village in this village of, some family in this village at Atliska. And um, the, the Atliska sponsors then, the Mayordomos, uh, spend the next year preparing the offerings. They get together all the lays. They provide the food for all 28 villages. They get together, I haven't said, but in this particular um, sinkhole rain calling ceremony, they make live offerings. Mm. So they get together turkeys and rabbits that they throw live really? into that sinkhole. Um, they provide all the, uh, the tamales for mm. three meals. 
They also go out into the uh, countryside here and harvest. Um, there's a different number every year. It's expensive. Uh, anywhere up to the year I went, there were uh, 14 McGay hearts, and these are these giant agave plants. Mm. They cut all the projecting limbs off of them and just use the big ball in the middle. It takes four men to carry mm. one of these. So is it all this, um, they this fill is them. an expensive process. Is this the re financial responsibility of the couple? Yes. Wow. And uh, you do that through a, a banking system okay. that you contributed to last year's and the year before, He's and the year before, forward then, uh, so you call in all your debts. Yeah, so, um, but the, it's really very interesting kind of cultural amalgamation of religious practice here uh, with the, the Catholic influence and the Aztec influence and popular religion I see playing in here as well. Uh, it's not just formal religion. Um, and in this instance, in this painting, in this pilgrimage that you're talking about, the sinkhole Mm -hmm. is the sacred um, geographical feature. So and what's going on with the sinkhole is um, Nawaz believe, as the Aztecs did, that um, Tlaloc, the rain god, is responsible for celestial water. So hail, snow, mm. fog, and rain all come from Tlaloc. And people who die a watery death, either by drowning or pleurisy or pneumonia or... Um, a lightning strike, go to the upper world and serve Tlaloc as helpers. And these helpers are what are known worldwide. It's the, exactly the same kind of phenomenon as little people. Yeah, yeah. And so by having a ceremony in a sinkhole, the distance down to the bottom is where the little people are. Okay. This sinkhole is huge. No one's ever seen the bottom of this sinkhole. Wow. And when they drop these hearts of Maguey over, they slide, four men struggling to get to the edge of this sinkhole, and then they let it slide down. I counted to 1,011 before it hit. Oh, my gosh. It's a huge sinkhole. 1,011. Yeah, I mean, 1,001, right. 1,002, oh, okay. 1,003. Okay. Uh, and the live ant, I mean, the turkeys yeah. don't have a prayer. Yeah. They can flap around for about wow. <laughs> a little bit. Well, this. We're just but when they the, we've just scratched the surface here, um, yes. and it's fascinating. I think you're going to have to come back. Oh, okay. Because we're out of time. Oh, but, okay. That went by quickly. Um, but I think that that you have uh, kind of reiterated what what's happening with pilgrimages, and I'm very envious of your um, your participation in these. And that's just fascinating the way you've kind of laid it out here for us today. And I really appreciate that. Yeah. Sure. Well, thank I'll, you. I'll come back and talk about mountaintops. All right. There, well, that's a good, that would be a, a great second program. Uh -huh. Thank you so much. Uh -huh. Sure. Well, that's it for this week on Religion and Life. Join us next week when our guest will examine Buddhism and the role it plays in helping to understand women's roles in contemporary Chinese culture. Until then, this is Ozzy Oswald. <laughs>